I am Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. And I want to give a great thanks right at the very start to Dr. Shalesky for doing this today. Dr. Gretchen Shalesky is the Director of the Faculty Development Fellowship at St. Margaret's, UPMC St. Margaret's, and she's Associate Director of the UPMC St. Margaret Residency Program. Dr. Shalesky, again, thanks and take it away. Great. Well, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity um, to talk with you about um, remote learning. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So, um, you know, I think COVID really thrust us into this world, whether or not we wanted to be here. Um, and so we are going to really talk about how do we do effective remote learning today. So if I could get you guys to use your chat bar. So um, if you can go ahead and open that up for me. Um, and I see in the chat bar, there's a question about it being recorded. It is being recorded um, so that other people can take a look at it later um, after the session. All right, so if you can tell me in the chat bar and I'd like everybody to participate in this, um, whether you're kind of a beginner with remote learning, um, or if you're somebody who's like pretty great at it and can do it pretty much everything that you need to do, or if you're really a professional remote learner. So if everybody could take a moment and jot that down to the chat bar, that would help me um, target my talk for you. Does everybody see your chat bar? Learning now, good. Somewhere in the middle. Excellent. Proficient, but not an expert. Getting my MPH online, so we're using Zoom, but um, not the best, but have some experience. Beginner in the middle. Clinical Dean, so been involved for decades. Excellent. So you'll really, um, I'd love for you to chime in for this conversation. In the middle, beginner, proficient, beginner to some experience, Fam more familiar with Google Meet, so just learning about Zoom. Um, and we're using WebEx or Zoom for a lecture, so kind of a, at least in the middle. Excellent. Thank you so much for um, everybody's input. So what we're going to learn about today, um, here are your objectives. We're going to list the requirements for your session at FMEC, demonstrate how to use the Zoom, how to use Zoom to create a video for FMEC, and then we're going to execute screen sharing and breakout rooms in Zoom. Um, so I don't have any um, fine faculty disclosures today. This is the slide deck that FMEC will want you to use. So I just wanted to put this as a, in as an example. So our rules, uh, rules for today, um, I would love it if you can put your cameras on, if you're in a place that you could do that. It's really great um, to see everybody's faces. It helps to create a sense of community. I would like your microphones off though, and I think that you guys have done a good job with that. I've been kind of checking in the participants bar. And I would really love for you to use this chat bar liberally. Um, ask me a question if something comes up, make a joke at something I said. Um, it's really just a way for us to connect as a community and have fun. If you are doing a live session, this is really a meta teaching moment. Setting up what you expect from your learners is a really important part of um, starting out the session. So they know what to expect from you and, and you um, can be sure that everybody heard what you had to say. All right, so I'm going to go into the, some of the requirements for FMEC. I know that they sent these out last night, and this QR code here you can use to take it directly to the document that they sent. Um, so we know that our workshops are going to be 60 minutes in length. You should log on 20 minutes prior to your session so um, that you can meet up with your moderator. And they will um, have a live interaction component, but it will be primarily by keyboard. Our seminars are 30 minutes, and then research papers, lecture discussions, clinical success stories, and speed presentations are all going to be 15 minutes, and they do not have a live interactive part, but we're going to talk about a way to still get some um, audience participation with that. Our program sessions should be three minutes in length, and there is an opportunity to do video chat or keyboard chat with that. Um, and then our network discussions are 60 minutes, and they will be live interaction. Um, and that would be by keyboard interaction. Um, some of the requirements for the videos. So we are gonna want um, 
the videos to be in the MP4 format. Um, it should be a 1080p resolution, and that should be shot in a horizontal frame, which is the default frame for computers. You want to have clear audio and good lighting. Just a reminder to introduce yourselves and your co-presenters as well as your session. Um, mention your compliance with the ethnic disclosures as I did today. And don't forget to close with your thank yous. Um, you do need to submit your video by September 11th and only one video will be accepted. So like if you make a mistake and you're like, hey, can you update my video? Um, they will not be allowed to be updated. Um, the slides will also be available to everybody after this um, talk. Um, you should get your upload instructions by the September 4th and the posters are a little bit different. You're going to host your three minute videos on an internet site like YouTube or Vimeo um, and you can upload that um, whenever you wanted to. And then your other material. So um, please um, use the FMEX slide template um, that I talked about before. Include your emails on the slides. So you see over here, this is another meta teaching point that I have my email on every slide so that if people are coming in late, which is probably not possible for a recorded lecture, um, but if they just need to be reminded about who you are, it's really readily available to them. And again, your material should be submitted by September 11th. Posters have a little bit longer. They have until 923, um, but they should also be saved as a PDF and your uploading instruction, instructions will be sent out on September 11th. Um, again, um, all of this is um, available on the sheet that was sent out to us last night, and this QR code will um, <laughs> I know. show you all of that. Nice to have human interaction. <laughs> I um, 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 just covered this briefly so that it was kind of all in one place. So for everybody who's doing presentation, I want to give you a get out of jail free card and give you a huge stamp of permission that you don't need to cover every single thing that you would have covered before. So most of us are going down in time. So if you were signed up for a seminar, it was going to be 60 minutes. Now it's 30. Workshops are cut down to 60 minutes as well. So I want you to really think about being thoughtful. Go back to your objectives. What do you want people to walk away with? What do you really want them to know as they walk out of the room? And so stay true to that message. Go ahead and cut content. It's okay. You don't have to tell everybody everything that they need to know about all things. Um, it is something that they can even contact with you. And in fact, that's what we want them to do. And that's why we want you to put your email there so that you can have these deeper conversations, that you can go more into um, some of the data that you found um, or that you wanted to review. And so um, I wouldn't just try to cram it all in to a smaller set of time. Um, and I see a, um, a chat in there from uh, uh, Tequila about getting the email. We'll make sure that you get that. All right, so now we know how long our video should be. I'm going to give you a few options. Um, we're going to briefly talk about PowerPoint and QuickTime Player as options for taping, but I really want to spend the majority of time talking about Zoom, um, just because it is the most versatile. All right. I do see some, I do hear somebody still talking. So if you guys could just check your microphones, that would be helpful. Let's see who is, who it is. <laughs> I tried to look quickly, but I can't see who it is. All right, so here we go. So we're gonna start with PowerPoint. Um, a lot of the times when you are recording a session, you're going to need to go into your privacy sessions. I have a Mac, so I, I'm bringing up what we have in the, in the Mac world. You're going to go to system preferences, which is up here, and you're going to go to the security and privacy tab. When you click on that, you'll have to find the, the tab that says microphone, and then you're going to want to turn it on. In this case, we're turning it on for Microsoft PowerPoint, but you would need to turn it on for Zoom and Teams and QuickTime Player. If you're already using those apps on your computer, the microphone is already turned on because it would have asked permission at the beginning. Um, but I, at least I don't routinely tape my PowerPoints, so I didn't have the microphone on. So you do have to turn that on before you start. Once you are um, have your microphone on, you're gonna, in order to record your PowerPoint pre um, presentation, you're gonna go up here to slideshow. 
and you're going to hit this record your slideshow button. You would go through your entire presentation, um, talking through your slides the way that you would normally do. And then when you're done, how would you get that to an MP4? Well, you go to your file menu and you say export. And when you hit this export, bu export button, it will bring up your save menu and the file type, the file format you would change to MP4. I would export that for you out to um, your, wherever you want to save it to. Obviously, um, the big limit to this is that it's just a PowerPoint presentation with you talking over it. So there's no opportunity for you to tape yourself, um, your, your video while this is going on. It's just a voiceover of your PowerPoint. Um, I don't love this idea for a conference, but it is one way that you can get your information out there. All right, so the next one that we're going to talk about is QuickTime Player. This is an app for Macs, but there are similar apps for Windows that are free. Um, similar to what we did for our um, PowerPoint, you do need to go to that privacy settings. Um, and you'll want to go to the uh, option to do a screen recording. And once you hit on that, you'll need to allow that for QuickTime Player. And it probably is already set up for you to have it in your other, uh, sorry, in your other apps. Um, but if not, you can also click those as well. So once you have decided you're going to use QuickTime, you're going to go up to your file. So you open QuickTime, you go to file, you're going to hit new screen recording. And um, one of the things that I um, realized last night is that you need to also go to options, which will be down in the bottom toolbar. And you're going to want to choose which microphone you're going to use. Um, if you say none, it will do a screen recording quite nicely, but it will be silent. Um, and so you'll um, want to make sure that you choose a microphone for that. Okay. And um, once you hit that, then it allows you to, to do a screen recording. I'm going to give you an example of something that I did last night. So, so make sure your volume is turned up. Here you go. Using QuickTime Player to record your presentation would work if you needed to do something that you wanted people to see on your computer screen. For example, I can show you how to do a path animation. So um, you can see me clicking around on the screen, you can see which options I'm actually choosing, and can see me doing the, the action itself. Okay, was everybody able to hear that okay? Yes, perfect. Great. So if you guys can put in the chat bar, what are some of the drawbacks to using QuickTimer that you guys could come up with? Never used it before. Okay. Um, you can't interact with folks when you're doing it. That, that's true. That is one of the kind of the drawbacks of all of our recordings. Um, what else? How do you make arrows point to stuff? Ah, that is a, um, a PowerPoint um, skill. I could show you that at the end. Editing, yeah. So having to do it in one shot. Um, so you kind of have to not make a mistake or if you make a mistake, you have to know how to edit the video. Good. One of the things that I like about using QuickTime is that you can really go between apps. So you can pull up your PowerPoint and um, show people um, your PowerPoint presentation. You can exit it and then go to a website. Um, you can exit it and go to a Word document, those sorts of things. But um, again, there's no, you don't, you can't be seen as the speaker. So if you're doing a screen recording, then you can't also record yourself um, when you're in QuickTime Player. You can do one or the other. Good. All right, so then um, we're going to go ahead and um, go into Zoom. Um, let's see. 
Um, so Judith, I think um, that is probably a question for Lisa and Larry, but I think that there's a rough draft of the schedule out that shows what everybody's been um, accepted for. And Gretchen, everyone should have received a, 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 an email message notifying them of acceptance and the category of their presentation. Excellent, thank you. All right, so I made a couple videos um, to show you how this is all done because you actually can't show how to record a video and sh do it in real time. <laughs> so, um, so let me give you some videos that I made for everybody last night. And we'll sit down and watch these here. Most versatile of the platforms, you would go Try that one more time. Most versatile of the platforms. You would go down here to this record button and click on that. You could record to your computer or the cloud. And it allows you to toggle between what you want to share. So whenever you're sharing in uh, Zoom, you have to have the window open already behind you. It can't be minimized. It must be already open. So you could share your PowerPoint. You go into presentation mode and that would come up for your learners. If you wanted to show them something different like a website, you would stop sharing. Go back to your share screen and look for your website that you wanted to bring up for them. Um, if you wanted to get out of that and go to a different modality, you would stop sharing. You can choose to go to the whiteboard. And here you can do drawings. Um, or even do text here. And then you can you can even toggle between other apps. So if you wanted to share something like the Word document, you can bring that up and type for, type for your participants there as well. You'll also notice that your picture stays up for the whole time in Zoom. So your um, audience is also getting to see your face as you're presenting. All right, so um, that's, I think Zoom is really the, is the most versatile of the platform since you'll have your picture up at the same time that you're presenting your material. Um, and I, I just wanted to show a really short video to see what it is like from the participant side. So what they see, they don't see kind of all that clicking around. Um, this is the video that I created. It's just a small snippet and I just wanted to show you what it looked like. It must be already open. So you could share your PowerPoint. You go into presentation mode and that would come up for your learners. If you wanted to show them something different like a website, you would stop sharing. Go back to your share screen and look for your website that you want. So I, I cut it off there because you had already seen that message. The really nice thing you'll see is that your picture of you and, and if you have a co-presenter, you both would be here. And so the, your participants are, participants are going to be able to see you for the whole entire time. Um, questions about that? Gretchen, I might make a, a comment if I might. Please do, yes. We've been doing um, a lot of remote proctoring <clears throat> for our students going through their shelf exams and so on. And we've learned through that and also through Zoom that it's sometimes really important to hardwire your computer uh, to, the, uh, to the modem. In other words, rather than uh, uh, relying on internet, even though you think you may have a strong uh, connection, if we're doing a presentation, um, we make sure everybody's hardwired. So that's, we learned that through uh, painful experiences. Yes, I, I will say that um, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about in, in just a little bit is that having a backup plan and having a backup plan for your backup plan is actually really an important thing to, to be sure that is in the back of your mind as you're creating these. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I got, I have this question in the chat bar about how do you make sure it's saved as an MP4? And, and in fact, that is the default setting for Zoom. So once you have recorded, and I recorded this to my computer, so then it was um, in my um, computer where 
um, where it asked me where I wanted to save it. And then you'll notice here it's Zoom as an MP4. And so that's the other nice thing about Zoom is that it's already in the format um, that FMEC would like it in when you're uploading it. Excellent, good. So we're going to move a little bit now into um, screen sharing for you and your co-presenters. But before I do, is there any questions about any of the stuff that I've presented so far? Okay, great. All right, so our next part then is about screen sharing. And I imagine that at this point, we're all pretty um, facile <laughs> at sharing our screen. Um, Josh Summer is asking, does this apply to your posters? So you can use Zoom to do your three minute video for your posters as well, sure. Um, so that they'll see your poster at the same time that they'll see your, your um, face. Um, so when we're doing this, the um, sharing of the screen in Zoom, there is a button here. This carrot will bring up a window where you can choose how you want people to share. So um, you, can, you can decide to do one participant or multiple participants at a time. And who can share? Do you want all your participants to be able to share? Um, and what happens when somebody else starts sharing? And so um, you can choose um, all those options that, that you're looking for. But the part that, you know, the button that we normally use is the share screen um, button here. And the really, and I, and I did say this already in the video part, but the, actually the important thing is that you need to have the windows up and running behind your Zoom already. If they are minimized, then they won't show up in this place um, for you to click on and share them. Um, the other thing that's really important, particularly if you have videos embedded, is that you want to click on this share computer sound so that people could hear what your computer sounds are. And so those are the two little trick, tricks that I have for screen sharing in Zoom. If you're presenting with a co-presenter, so the both of you will be on a call and you'll be um, both wanting to be on the video, when you're um, in the screen share, you're going to go up to this view options button here. Um, and you're going to have your co-presenter when they need to, to have control of the PowerPoint request remote control. That will bring up a window for the host that looks like this. And you're going to want to approve that or decline it if you want to mess with your co-presenter, but probably you'll want to approve it. Once they have control of your, the presentation, then they can advance their slides as they want to. That kind of, um, uh, avoids that, can you advance it to the next slide kind of discussion. All right, let's see. Great, so then, then I was just reading the chat bar. So then the next thing that we're going to talk about, um, most of us I know are going to be recording our sessions for FMEC, um, but if you are doing a live workshop or a network discussion, I just wanted to also touch base about how do you do breakout rooms. Um, one word about workshops, um, I, Larry and I were kind of talking about what would be the best way to present workshops. You do have an hour of live time I think it probably is the safest thing to record somewhere about 45 minutes of material and leave 15 minutes at the end for questions that come up either as the presentation is going on or that come up at the end. Um, if, you, if you want to, to go out on a limb and, and hope that the technology does not misbehave on you and that your Wi-Fi works and that the system doesn't crash, you have an hour to, to present your material. And so if you wanted to make it interactive throughout, it, it, you can give it a shot. But I would make sure that those backup plans that we were talking about before, that you really have a few to fall back on so that if the first one doesn't work, you have a, a, an idea about what you're going to tell your participants to do. Um, if you are going to be in the live sessions, one of the wonderful things about break uh, about Zoom is that they have really easy breakout rooms. Um, so you need to be the host um, in order to use the breakout rooms. You can't even just be the co-host. You have to actually be the host. Once you're the host, this button right here will show up for you that says breakout rooms. You will um, you can either check that you want them to automatically form or that you want them to manually form and you get to choose how many rooms you want to make. The nice thing about Zoom is they do all the calculations for you, and so you'll see how many participants per room are down here. 
when you check on the create the breakout rooms, this um, folder will come up. And in fact, when your participants are all there, this will be full of names. Um, and you can even move people around. So even if you automatically assign somebody to a group, you can choose to assign them to a different group before you open the rooms. And then there are some cool options in Zoom for the breakout rooms. So you can move all your participants into the rooms automatically so you don't have to wait for them to click. Um, you can make your participants stay in their room or you can allow them to come back to the main session when they're done with their task. And then you can also um, decide how much time they can have. So, I love Zoom for breakout rooms because unlike when we were doing breakout um, sessions in person and you're trying to call people back and they keep going with their conversations, you can actually just physically pull people back to Zoom and they have to stop talking because they're coming back to the main room. So I really like this part about Zoom. It's one of my favorite options. Questions about any of that? Um, Dave Stelter says, are private chats truly private or, care, or can the host or the recording actually see the discussion? Um, I believe that the chats, and, and you might be able to help me with this, um, Dave, that um, I believe the chats are, are part of the saved documents from the, um, the package. So the recording itself, the MP4 that is done is the, the person who's talking and anybody else who might be on the screen and their presentation. But the whiteboard and the chats come across as um, text files. And so they are also saved, but not in the same way. Um, I, as far as I know, the private chats are private because I've used them a lot. And I don't think that other people than my intended audience has seen them. Right, I think that within the conversation, <clears throat> the group can't see the private chats. But the question really was, um, is this all this material kept somewhere at some point so somebody can see them? And I learned this morning that it, that it is, that whoever the host is or whoever's recorded can actually see that, but I'm not quite sure. But I guess the, the real thing is to be careful what you say anyway. Yes, thank you. I, I actually hadn't known that the host sees all of the private conversations, so that's a good thing to know. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not positive, but I, I learned that this morning from somebody who had a webinar session in Colorado yesterday. So um, but I'll, if I can find out, I'll let you know. Okay, excellent. Um, any questions about what I've shared some far, so far? I, I have a little bit of a brainstorming session for the, to, to finish this up here, but I wanted to give um, some time for questions. Hi, uh, my name is Elisa. Sorry, I like just got done with clinic, so I kind of missed everything. Is this recorded or are you able just to highlight like the main things that we're supposed to know? Yeah, it is, it is recorded and it will be available right after we're done here. Good, other, other questions? All right, a couple, um, just a couple tips that I really like um, and and I would love to hear other people's tips as well. Um, I have um, a double screen um, computer going on. Um, this allows me to see my slides and presentation mode. So if that's something that you are fond of, <laughs> um, I am really fond of seeing my notes and, and that helps me um, in my presentations. And so if you just have a double screen, like a monitor in your laptop, something like that, you would be able to have uh, both screens up and running. Um, the other thing that I really enjoy having, and so this is going to sound a little bit crazy, but I have a third um, screen. So I have a second device um, so that I can see what you guys are seeing. So that really makes it easy for me to know if, if like my video is not working. Um, so I don't have to do the, uh, can you see what I'm seeing? Do you, um, can you hear me? Those sorts of questions um, because um, I'm seeing what you're seeing. So um, you can do that on a phone. Um, you could do that on a, another laptop if you have it. Um, you could do it on an iPad. Um, so it just gives you a little bit um, of versatility and, and let, lets you know what your audience is seeing. Does anybody ever, does anybody have any other tips that you have used when you're presenting with Zoom that you'd like to share with the audience? So Gretchen, this is Larry, if I can comment, there is a question here. Uh, can we provide attached handouts for participants? 
And I think the example you used of creating the QR code, you can put that in a slide. And so that's an easy way then people can scan it and they've got the handouts right there. Um, and I believe, um, Larry, obviously you, you would know more than I, but I think you're allowed to include handouts with the presentation when you upload it. So people should have, should have a way to access that um, there as well. And someone else is mentioning that there is a share function. Right, so if you wanted to um, toggle between your uh, PowerPoint and the PDF, so if you just wanted to share your, your screen, you can exit out of your PowerPoint and bring up the PDF that you're talking about. You can only share one thing at a time when you're in Zoom, so you would have to exit the PowerPoint and then bring up the, the PDF. But, um, but that's certainly um, an easy way to do that. And absolutely, you can add that, the link or the file into the chat box, absolutely. Um, I, I guess uh, that's true if you're gonna be in person and run, running the live session, but that chat bar won't be available when you're videoing it. Um, and so if, if you're one of the sessions that does not have a live interactive part, then you'll have to provide that PDF a different way. Other questions? All right, well, I would just like to take a moment and, and hear people's thoughts. So I'm gonna ask you a, a few questions, three questions to be exact, and I want you to type a response into the chat box, but I don't want you to hit send until I tell you to. That will just give everybody kind of enough time to think and think through the question, um, and then we'll get a variety of answers from all of our participants. So our first question is, how do you normally engage your audience? So go ahead and take a minute and type that into the chat box. All right, and go ahead and hit send. Let's see what ideas people have. Um, asking questions, having contribute some material, using humor, pictures and polls, um, chat questions, um, interactive questions, telling an emotional story, um, having them interact with some kind of questions through the chat box, um, eye contact, polls, excellent. So these are really great um, ways. So, so you guys actually uh, already are a little bit a uh, step ahead because um, when I was saying normally, I was thinking about in-person audience, but the next question is, how would you modify that if you're doing a live Zoom session? So don't hit send yet, go ahead and type it in. But thinking about what are some of the things that you can normally do when you're in-person teaching in a live Zoom? session. All right, go ahead and hit send. Um, I see using the chat, um, asking them to click their video on, asking questions individually. That's really good. Um, like calling people out individually seems to work really well virtually. Um, uh, virtually nothing. I I'm not exactly sure what the um, answering, sometimes you get an answer that maybe you don't want to hear. I'm not exactly sure what that means. I'm sorry. Um, discussion questions on chat, breakout rooms for small group discussions, polls, telling a story or, or joke to start. So kind of the same skills we we're using before. Asking questions, but, but needing time for the chat responses. Absolutely. Um, polls or poll everywhere is another good one to use. Um, you can tell a personal story and ask a question um, and then maybe even think about giving the answers that you've gotten before um, and starting with a soft opening to get the chaos settled down. Those are all really lovely thoughts. Um, uh, I appreciate everybody chiming in. Um, Dave, would you kind of talk a little bit more about that soft opening if you wouldn't mind? Sure. <clears throat> um, one thing that I find interesting is when people try to literally transfer something that is live to digital, 
and they they it becomes either stilted or completely off base. There's a lot of chatter, people trying to figure out how things work and so on. It's like starting a small group session. One of the things that I found worked in a small group live session is to break bread, literally, you know, have donuts and coffee or bagels or something like that. So people can just start to talk to each other and get into a rhythm. And once that starts and you have their attention, then you can ease into the actual presentation. Excellent, great idea, thank you. So, you know, a, a lot of our teaching techniques can be modified to live Zoom. We, we actually were able to use Zoom for our summer intensive series and the fellowship. Um, and a lot of the things that you guys talked about, so using breakout rooms, um, we actually, we had an audience that was, was um, close enough or knew each other well enough that when we wanted to do a think pair share, we actually called each other on a cell phone so that it, you know, we, we could just do that um, one, one on one time that way. Um, we certainly have used a physical whiteboard. So, uh, you know, in the summer series, I really appreciated seeing people's faces. So I would have everybody on gallery view, everybody's um, picture would be on the screen. And then I would write on a physical whiteboard so that I can see their reaction and, and what they were thinking to what I was writing on the whiteboard. So there, you know, you can even do some kind of low tech things um, that make the, the modality more interesting, adding videos, adding a hook, um, you know, we remember that that about at 10 minutes, people lose um, their concentration. And so thinking about how do you build in those hooks um, will be really important in, in a live Zoom and, and in recorded session, sessions as well. All right, and my last question for you, I think this is probably the hardest question that I'll ask you today. Um, uh, Dave is asking about the polling feature. Absolutely. So I didn't actually show our the screenshots from polling, but I have um, I do have a presentation that does show that um, and and zoom does have this polling feature, which is nice. The thing I think I like most about polling in zoom is that you can set up your poll beforehand um, so that it's ready to go when you need it. Um, some of the other platforms you have to set that up like as you're in the presentation essentially. And so that's one of the nice things about Zoom is that you can set that up before your presentation ever begins. I don't know enough about um, polls in Zoom to speak about how that would work in a remote, um, you know, in a taped presentation. I'm, I'm guessing it just it, it wouldn't work because <laughs> um, there's not a, a live link that, that you could go to. Um, I, I'd have to look more into that because I do know that you can leave a poll open for a little bit, but I'm not exactly sure how that works. Does anybody else know? It may be possible to use a poll everywhere um, if you left the poll open, but probably only one question. Um, does anybody in the audience have any ideas about if you were going to do a, um, obviously if you're doing a live Zoom, it's easy, but if you're doing a taped session? Gretchen, you probably wouldn't be able to do it on a taped session because it's canned and not accessible, but it would be a feature that you would continue with, you transition to your live Zoom and be able to do it that way. Yeah. Um, and the, for sure you would be able to like set up a survey. So, you, you know, rather than having a live poll, you could think about setting up like a Google form or um, like a survey monkey or something like that, where people would take, would, could go to a link and take um, a poll, but it would be more like a survey. So that would be a way to work around that. And that's a good suggestion. We use that to, <clears throat> to set the stage so people have done their homework ahead of time and it advances the conversation when you start. Excellent, yes. Um, and I see Judith is saying, I'm considering sharing a poll from a previous live webinar to show how others answered a question. I think that's a lovely idea as well. All right, so the hardest question that I have for you today and, and the one I wanna spend a few minutes on is how can you modify that interactive stuff? We've kind of already started talking about it, but what are some ideas out there that you guys can think about is how can you make your, your taped session feel more interactive to your audience? So go ahead and, and type some ideas into the chat box. I'll give you a few sessions, seconds. Um, don't hit send until I tell you to. Okay, go ahead and hit send. Let's see what people's thought. Yeah, storytelling, absolutely. 
um, that is a, an, an excellent way to start the conversation. Making the emotional con connection, using images or common, answering common questions, um, involving multiple presenters, absolutely. Um, conversing with your collaborator, your co-presenter, yep. Um, Tammy says being aware of voice, tone, and pitch, and resonance, and making it more engaging, absolutely. Um, discussion questions in, in the breakout rooms, um, right? Even if you're not having breakout rooms, maybe just having your discussion um, questions in your um, presentation. Um, when you're teaching like this, I use myself as the questioner and the person answering the question. Yes, excellent ideas. Um, pauses to let people think and respond, a conversational style. Excellent, yep. Um, yeah, and, and um, to Kayla saying, I, you only have three minutes to present the poster. And um, when we do our poster presentations in our fellowship, we really think about that. We actually shoot for about a minute. We think about an elevator speech. So introducing yourself, saying what your topic's about, and then inviting somebody to come and see you. Um, so it would be a little bit hard with only three minutes, of course, to get the interactive part in there. These are excellent suggestions. Anybody have a second suggestion or something that came up as you're reading the other thoughts from other people? Gretchen, the thing that occurred to me is you could have a little bit of fun. If you're both the person asking the question and the person answering the question, you might want to change your voice uh, in a way to start speaking with a little bit of difference and, you know, just have some fun. There, there's no reason that an academic uh, presentation has to be um, uh, spiritless. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, excellent. Um, I think the uh, anybody else before I, I give just one other thought. Um, I think the only other thing that I thought about um, that might potentially might work is if you if you do have a couple people that that would kind of be willing to be audience members and kind of play off of you, um, whether that's your co-presenter or you know a, a couple friends that you have around or something like that, and kind of um, kind of imitating that give and take that you might want from a from an audience. Um, what we just did here is an example of something that you can do when you're doing a live Zoom session is to ask people some questions. Um, as you saw, I, I asked you not to hit return so that everybody kind of had a chance to chime in and, and not just kind of let other people answer. And so that's a, a, it's a good technique to use. Um, Marty says using connectors between slides, like as I mentioned before. Yep. Um, so Gretchen, if I can comment on yes. the one about, uh, are we allowed to use the video they submit? Uh, yes, absolutely. It, it's your material and um, you, you're free to use that wherever. It will also be in an on-demand library for 30 days following the meeting. So anyone who's registered the, for the meeting has, uh, has access to it during that period. Um, Dave is talking about having pre-recorded voices asking questions. That's a lovely idea to, to not always be your voice. That's lovely. Um, and then Cindy, um, Larry, would you be able to answer Cid, Cid, Cindy's question about if we know how many people will be at our sessions? There is really no way to do that in this uh, particular platform. Um, so no is the answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I would um, come back to this idea of having your email address on there. So I think the idea for seminars and um, lecture discussions and the um, uh, clinical success stories and those that don't have this live component, we do really expect that people will be emailing you. You know, we're going to encourage that they email you during your presentation. So being able to be there, if you if you feel comfortable getting your cell phone number out, you can invite people to call you if, if that's something that you would like to do. So there are ways to kind of simulate some of this stuff, although it's obviously a lot more clunky than if we were in person together. So this might be a time for me, Gretchen, to explain why we made the decisions that we, we did. So we interviewed um, probably five or six organizations that held virtual meetings as part of our learning how to do it. And to a person, they said, get your presenters to pre-record. So many things can go wrong on the, on the day of, uh, you know, that are out of your control. So somebody cuts a power line in the next block over and your whole subdivision 
um, or your neighborhood loses access to the internet. If you're live, you're gone. There's no way to, to get that back. If it's pre-recorded, uh, you don't have to worry about those kinds of things. Um, so we, we made that decision to recommend uh, the pre-recorded. The only uh, live, live presentations will be um, uh, Dr. Kamara Jones on Saturday morning with her plenary. And I think we've got a couple other, uh, like welcome to the meeting. And we may even pre-record those. But everyone has told us uh, things crash left and right. So just this week, as the annual STFM meeting was starting with live Zoom meetings, Zoom went down across the country. They had no control over that. And, and so that's what happens when things are lives. The, 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 the chance for that is very, very high. Thanks for the explanation, Larry. We appreciate it. All right, so um, that brings me to the end of the stuff that I wanted to cover today. Um, listing the requirements for your session at FMEC, demonstrating how to use Zoom to create a video for FMEC, and executing screen sharing and breakout rooms in Zoom. I am happy to take any additional questions that you might have. Um, and I think somebody asked about how do you create an arrow and how do you move it? I'm happy to show you that as well, if that's something you'd like to see. And at the end here, Gretchen, I've got a couple comments that I want to make uh, to the group, but yeah. I want people to um, ask their questions of you first. So I have a question. Um, so for what I understand, we're going to pre-record this, we're going to send it. Like in my case, I have a lecture. So it's going to be 15 minutes of my lecture. And after that is an, another one coming, uh, or uh, I even understand that there's not going to be questions and answer. Um, so it's going to be one lecture followed by another? That is correct. Okay, and the way you. again that people can reach you if they have questions, is if you've put your email address and or your uh, cell phone, they can uh, email you their questions. I'm sorry it's not more interactive, but we're sort of, uh, that's the way the platform No, I, I completely understand. I think this is, this is a good way. Um, I mean, oh, COVID have changed a lot of stuff and we're still finding, figuring out things. And, and I think this is a, a good beginning. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, though, I, I, and Larry, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think the lecture discussion total time is 15 minutes. Yes. So your, yes. your video would be 15 minutes. Um, and that is kind of what I was um, alluding to when I was giving you that get out of jail free card. You probably are not going to be able to cover all the, the material you were thinking about covering in that 30 minutes. So you'll really have to pare it down and be prepared to kind of cut out the, the things that don't come right to your point quickly. Perfect, thank you. A question alongside the same lines, uh, considering that, well, for, for my presentation specifically, it's been cut down a lot. So I, I, I think the content's gonna be a lot different, but I think that changes actually like the learning objectives and the title, maybe even the title of the presentation. So are we able to make those changes to like, what's gonna be on the schedule so people know what they're getting into when they're watching it. So I would say if you're planning on changing the title, um, the learning objectives uh, aren't um, made public unless you're putting them on a, you know, a, a slide. But if you're gonna change your title, you have till tomorrow to let us know. We have to get these in ahead of time and once they're in, the rigidity uh, of these IT platforms, it's not like a face-to-face -face meeting where you know, um, two weeks before the meeting, we can make changes. Um, we are in a very, very tight schedule with them. So I would say, if you can find a way to um, make sense with your, your current title, that would be awesome. But if you really feel it, it needs to be changed, take a look at it and decide by tomorrow. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you.
can you clarify once more? I, I, I hope I didn't miss this, but given the type of presentation and the and the length of the session, actually how long the recorded portion is, is supposed to be? So for a seminar, it's this. For a this is that. I can I can bring that up for you actually. Just one more question, like the seminar, 30 minutes. Does that mean it's a 30 minutes recorded thing or 15 minutes recorded with 15 minutes for questions? So there's not an interactive part for the seminars, so it would just be the 30 minutes of recorded time. So Gretchen, for the, for the poster with the three minutes um, and then one-to-one -one video chat, how does that work and how long does that take? So with the poster, um, what we're, you know, think of, of you walk into a poster hall and you've got all the posters lined up and you have the presenter standing in front of it. So you'll be able to go into the poster hall, the virtual poster hall. You'll see the poster, the title uh, uh, listed there, and you'll be able to click on that and the abstract will pop up. You'll further be able to click and the poster, an image of the poster itself, if the poster presenter has uploaded that. And then if you want to talk with the person, there's an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one video chat where just like what we're doing right now, you would see the person and they would see you. If you're a poster presenter, there are three poster sessions. We've split them up because we know trying to do 100 posters in an hour is, is maddening. You can't get through all that. But so we've broken them into groups of approximately 30. Uh, we've clustered them by topics so people can go in and take more time to uh, interact with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, presenter. The person, you'll have to look at the, the schedule to see when your poster is scheduled to be presented and you should be available at that time uh, so that you can participate in the uh, video chat. And then during the next two poster sessions, you don't need to be present because your, your scheduled presentation time is, is completed. So that means we don't have to create a video for the poster session? Um, you don't have to. Um, you know, what that does is I think it standardizes your pitch, so to speak, and um, probably a little more efficient. And if somebody really has a question uh, beyond what they've read, the title, the abstract, they've seen in the poster, and they've, they've heard in your presentation, then they would be uh, coming to you one-on-one. -on -one. So I, I would recommend that you do it, but you don't have to. So the total time is three minutes, including chat? Uh, no, the total time for the recorded message total is three minutes. The chat would be uh, all the way through that hour. Got it. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm still confused on posters. Um, at, at one point, um, I thought I just heard that it's a still image of the poster, which is uploaded and delivered for people to view. Um, uh, but then I also heard that it could be a video as long as three minutes. And those are quite different things. Um, so is it one, the other? Is it an option? Um, which way to go? Are, are we being given the option of taking a poster and turning it into a very short PowerPoint presentation to walk through what we did? I, I'm puzzled by this. So Josh, that, um, yes, yes, <laughs> and yes. So you should have, you know, your abstract, it, we, we're uploading your abstract that you submitted um, back uh, at the beginning. Um, so the, the title is there, the abstract is there, if you want that three minute to be, you, it's, it's your video recording using Zoom the way Gretchen has shown. You could make it a, a short uh, three minute PowerPoint if you would wanna do that. Or you could just record yourself giving your pitch as you would if somebody walked up to your poster. And then if the uh, viewer wants to talk with you one-on-one, -on -one, they would be uh, approaching you for the, the uh, video chat. Does that help? 
Thank you. Um, Larry, I don't know if you saw in the chat bar, there's a question about file size limit. You know, that's a good question. I don't know that I know the answer to that. Uh, I, I know Lisa's uh, in the background here. Um, we, we can find out and put a message out uh, to everybody. So with just five minutes left, Gretchen, I'm going to go ahead and make a few comments. Number one, thank you all for being willing to present uh, in, a, in a very unusual setting. I, I have to tell you, um, it was pretty disheartening to me. Uh, I was really, really hoping back in March and April that things would, would clear up and that we'd be able to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, but it just cannot happen. So it's it's awkward and it's new learning for all of us. And myself included, I am not a, 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 a techie person like Gretchen is, who's very facile with these things. Um, so the learning curve has been uh, pretty dramatic. And for my team, uh, it's been uh, very uh, uh, dramatic and, and we're still learning. So thank you for being willing to present. I will tell you that we had a choice. We interviewed a number of uh, meetings that already had gone virtual and were planning to go virtual and they helped informed our decision making. So for example, SDFM, which is going on right now, they made a choice to take all of their accepted presentations and put 90% of them into a library and only 10% are available for viewing. And there's like one presentation at a time. We chose not to do that. Uh, we thought that it's really important because of the nature of our meeting. We have a lot of um, uh, new uh, presenters, a lot of young faculty and residents that they really needed an opportunity to, uh, to uh, present. And, but we couldn't put everyone uh, in a live uh, presentation format so that it was interactive as though you were in a conference room in a, in a hotel. I will tell you that the cost of, of these decisions is, is remarkable. So for example, for every pre-recorded presentation, whether it's a, a workshop or a seminar or a, a lecture discussion, it costs $115 from the, uh, the, the IT company to upload that. For every live presentation, it's $400. So you can do the math on a couple hundred presentations and and it's just extraordinarily uh, expensive. So we had to make decisions. We wanted people to have a chance to present. The other part of this is our meeting is known for its networking. We have a high energy meeting. Students, residents, and faculties love it because of, of all of the things that we've packed in together from the residency fair to the breakfast discussions, the lunch discussions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we struggled with how do we make this as interactive as possible so that networking, so new, new relationships, people can bump into each other. And that's why we think it's really important for you to put at least your email address on your slides so people can contact you. The networking discussion sessions are a primary vehicle for people to come together. And we have uh, uh, quite a few of those, more than we usually do. We also have uh, the residency fair um, broken into three sessions. We actually have more time for the students and the residents to come together than we would in our normal meeting. In our normal meeting, you have four hours spread over two nights. You now have six hours spread over three days. So um, that allows for more interaction. The other thing that we created is hot topics and family medicine. So on the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday before our meeting, any residency program that is registered in the residency fair can pick out a topic that they'd really like to talk about, whether it's rural health, wilderness medicine, uh, maternal child care, uh, care for the underserved, and they will have an opportunity for a one hour Zoom meeting. We will advertise those to all the students who are registered for the meeting. And that provides your program an opportunity, relatively informal for you to showcase and attract the attention of students who can then come later in the week to the residency fair looking for your booth uh, uh, to talk with you. So we really encourage you uh, 
uh, to look at the hot topics. And we've got a list like 21 topics that you could pick from, or you may have something. Uh, Josh, you always come up with really creative, uh, innovative things. You may have something that you want to do that's <clears throat> that's different. There's an other, you can add your own topic uh, in, in to do that. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, someone asked a question. So once you've recorded your Zoom meeting, if you record it to your computer, I think, it, Gretchen, you can tell me if this is correct. If you record it to your computer, it's relatively easy to upload it to YouTube. Actually, I don't use YouTube at all. I'm so sorry oh. I can't speak about this, um, but maybe somebody else on the call can. I, I actually, um, for the, the fellowship, we use a Google Drive because um, it's, it's easy for everybody to access that. So we've been using a Google Drive to upload all of our um, videos there. That's interesting because we get a lot of feedback from uh, uh, programs and even our board members that their hospitals, uh, I, firewalls, will block anything related to Google. I don't usually do it at work. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, then you can bypass. But YouTube is, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to use. It's a couple clicks uh, to get it uploaded and then you've got the uh, link that you can share. Um, so, so we're, we're running uh, close in time. In fact, it's it's that time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shalesky, for uh, this session. It has been recorded. We will be uh, sending it out shortly. And we hope, oh, the other thing is don't forget to register for the meeting. Um, we, uh, every presenter, just like a face-to-face -face meeting, every presenter is expected to uh, register for the meeting. So um, thank you. And again, thank you to all of you for coming here today. Um, Larry, there was a question about do people who are doing the posters need to also do a disclosure statement for the for even for the poster presentation? Um, I, well, they could if they're using PowerPoint slides uh, to do that. Um, I'm not sure how they would do that unless it was on their uh, their poster itself. So maybe in the bottom right hand corner or something yeah. like saying that they don't have any disclosures. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all. Thank you. This has been very helpful. Good. Bye.